Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. I've got a return guest today and I'm chomping at the bit for this conversation because Morgan Daimler, the Morgan Daimler is here. She's an expert in all things fairy. I'm going to recommend also, if you love what you hear today, go back and listen to her first interview on the show because we're covering all new material today. It lit people on fire. I was hearing from so many people who were buying her books and awakening to this idea of fairy with the details that Morgan provides. So highly recommended. This show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger just won in Denver recently the Coalition for Visionary Resources Award for Best Radio Show and Podcast and is listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to. Hoorah! I've been doing this 15 years, so I love receiving the recognition for the work I do. So thank you and thanks for being on this journey. And by the way, subscribe, like, post, I read them all and I do really appreciate you guys so much. I also appreciate my sponsor, Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. If you'd like to be a facilitator or take a class anywhere in the world, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. Right now I am doing a five day Facebook live challenge for folks who want to learn how to be interviewed on podcasts. I love the healers, spiritual people who have gotten involved. It is my joy spot. So that's what I do. Media visibility out into the world. I help coaches, speakers, healers, etc. learn the three steps and the three pieces and you don't have to do them all. That's the big secret. You can pick what resonates with you. If you would like to learn how to write a highly engaging page turner book, you can join my book writing class at debbiedashinger.com slash visible visionaries. I also take authors books to a guaranteed international bestselling status. I do all the heavy lifting and you can write on my contact form at debbiedashinger.com if you're interested. And the third part is the ultimate visibility, how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get great results. If you're interested in these, becoming more visible at a time when I think it's very important for light workers, please accept my free gift. I've got templates, I've got videos with how to's all come to you for free. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. So hurrah, this episode features Morgan Daimler and she's an author, a witch, yummy, priestess who sees and communicates with fairies and elementals. My guest writes about Irish myth and magical practices, fairies and related subjects. Morgan is a blogger, poet, teacher of esoteric subjects, which priestess of the Deowin Mata, I said that right. And Morgan is a prolific pagan writer having published more than a dozen books under Moon Books alone. And she's one of the world's foremost experts on all things fairy. Morgan's books, please check the show notes so you can get yours. Obviously they're on Amazon. You wanna spell her last name correctly, D-A-M-I-L-I-E-R. Or you can go to johnhuntpublishing.com and she's got an entire author page. She will, she will delight you because she's got so many wonderful books to choose from. And with that, I bring back to the show, Morgan Daimler. Yes, so great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me back on. We had a, an interesting hitch at the very beginning to start this, and I was baffled. I've never seen technically anything like that happen. And you said, oh, it's the fairies. So why do you think, why do you think, and you said they've shown up before when you do interviews and they know you're going to talk about them. Why do you think they do that? You know, I honestly think it's, it's a way to just get people's attention and make it clear that they are present, that they are there. Um, you know, not you, of course, because you're amazing. And I know that you have a lot of belief in this, but I think, 
you know, with other um, interviews and things that I've done, it's a way to get the host to be a little more uh, open <laughs> mm. to believing um, and just, just a way to demonstrate that they, they really are there. Because as we were talking about right before we started, it's, it's these weird things that people don't have problems with normally. Um, and it only ever seems to happen when it's me <laughs> and only when I'm talking about this. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I'm kind of honored that they know and they definitely have my attention. Yep. So I'm glad I'm it happened before we started. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> I just want to hold up two of your gorgeous books. Um, this one, which I, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to dive into this into shadow the talon chronicles oh my god i love stuff like this so i cannot wait because girl i need a good novel i really do i need to escape this is summer escape so i just want to hold these up of course you've, they, she's got plenty more books for you to choose from and the book we are going to be talking about today oh to look like the woman on the cover <laughs> She's so gorgeous. Is Pagan Portals Fairy Queens Meeting the Queens of the Other World? Oh, hello. So I have two interesting questions for you because they popped before we connected. And I want to, because you see these things, and I love that you make a living, a juicy living. You're a busy, busy person with fairies and otherworldly things. That's amazing, right? Welcome to 2022. What a healing. So what for you in all your time of interacting with the other worldlies has been the most scary experience that you've had if you don't mind me asking that's a very good question um i have to, i've had a couple that were very unnerving um i think probably the the one that i would say was the most frightening would be, I was in a, a state park local to where I am that is kind of known, it has a reputation among people who are sensitive to these things for having a lot of fairy things going on, otherworldly things going on. Um, so this isn't just like my personal impression, like people around here kind of know this place. Um, and I was there one day and there's a waterfall and then a, a little river and I'd kind of gone off the path try to walk down closer to the river by the bottom of the waterfall which of course you're not supposed to actually go there but I was um, and I, I came around this one sort of section of rock rock wall and there was a little like inlet with the water and there was something in the water um, a, a fairy being but one of the ones that's not as happy about humans and I remember freezing and she was looking at me and I was looking at her and there was just a strong sense of like, if I, if I kept going forward, it was gonna be very bad for me. Um, and I think that's the most afraid I've been because I, I kind of, it's like if you round a corner and there's a bear mm. and the bear's not mm. doing anything, yes. But you just sort of know like that whatever you do in the next few seconds is going to make a difference <laughs> for how it comes out for you. So I just kind of put my hands up and then backed away really slowly <laughs> and went back around the corner and figured, you know what, she just, she wants to be alone and she does not want me there. And I'm going to respect that <laughs> and find somewhere else to go. Um, but so I think Martin, that what kind of thing could she when you felt that imminent danger, like you you felt the line drawn, mm -hmm. what kind of things potentially could she have done to you if she had chosen to? I mean, the the type of being that she could have been, because there's a couple options, but the the more dangerous things that are associated with water, um, when they're angry at people or upset or you know whatever else is going on with them. They are known in stories to drown people. Um, so that was sort of my concern in that moment. <laughs> um, just because water spirits in particular tend to have a little more of an extreme reputation, uh, whether it's for helpful reasons, like some of them are known to be very beneficial and very helpful to humans. 
Um, you hear stories about like Selkies, the seal people that'll save sailors in storms and, you know, so there's more positive. I don't want to make this sound like it's all negative. There's more positive, but the ones that are a little more on the, the anti-human side of things, that's usually the direction it goes in. So, so you're sensitive, you're aware, you can see, right? So you actually had visual contact and obviously self-preservation. It's like, there's other places to go in nature. Don't worry, backing off. So right. you're doing that. Now, let's say somebody comes along who's like, doy, do doy, do doy, doesn't see elementals, doesn't have a clue like you could, and she's there pissed. Could something have happened to somebody who was blissfully ignorant? It could have, um, you know, and that's, that's usually like the worst case scenario. A lot of times, even people who aren't sensitive, um, who can't see, but also who just generally aren't sensitive to spiritual things will still get a very strong feeling of like unease, um, like that sort of a chill with no explanation, like that feeling of hostility, even if they don't know why. Um, it's, it's only rarely that you'll get someone who will ignore that or push through it. Um, and then usually, yeah, that's not gonna end very well. Um, so we do have a lot of stories like in the, in the folklore and even modern accounts of, of people who run into problems because of stuff like that. Okay, and conversely, what for you, Morgan Daimler, is the most profound, positive, maybe even life-changing experience you've had with otherworldly? Sure. So I, I kind of, there's two stories I could tell here, and they're, they're both are around healing. Um, one was, was my personal experience. Um, I was in Iceland uh, with a, a tour group. We were going to different like, spiritual sites. And we had one day that was kind of a, a more relaxed, like in the middle of things sort of day. And I got very sick and I was kind of panicking because we're in a foreign country. Um, we're also sort of in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's like a hundred something miles to a hospital. And I was like, I don't, I really don't know what I'm going to do. Like we have this one day to rest, but then the next day we're supposed to be back on the bus doing all the things. And so I had sort of walked out and so it's going to sound a little random, but followed a trail of mushrooms to a mushroom circle, which is a, a thing associated with fairies. Um, and I normally tell people not to do things like this, but I did. Wandered off into the wilderness <laughs> following mushrooms. And I kind of found this spot and I just had this moment where I was sort of like, I need some assistance here. And that night I went to bed. Uh, I was sharing a room with a friend of mine and I woke up like completely woke up um, instantly. And it was like three in the morning and there were three figures standing around my bed. And I remember in the moment feeling very warm. Like, I think I probably had a fever, but not enough that I, this wasn't happening. And looking at the figures, they were human size figures and just thinking to myself, okay, these are our elves, Alfar um, in Iceland. And there's nothing I can do about this. So I'm going to go back to sleep, <laughs> which is what I did. Um, it was a very peaceful, like I didn't feel any kind of threat from them. Um, I felt safe. Uh, and I woke up that next morning and I was perfectly fine. I was not sick at all. Um, I had had, I think it was probably bronchitis. So it was not the sort of thing that you normally, you have it one day and then you wake up the next day and you're fine. Um, and I, I really truly believe that that was a, a healing experience with them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one story. And then the second story was not me personally, but my, um, my 14 year old has a lot of medical issues. Um, but when they were 11, they were diagnosed with scoliosis. And so we were seeing the doctor for that and it, the curve in the spine was getting to where they were just starting to debate whether they would have to um, put my kid in, in a brace. Um, and my kid is autistic. So that was not something that was gonna go over well, we'll just say. 
Um, and I kind of had the same sort of moment where I, I went to the particular fairies, the particular um, good folk that I am, have a strong connection to. And I was just like, I, I just need, I need some help here, you know, because I, I don't ask that the, she be completely healed. I'm not asking that like every medical issue be resolved, but just this one particular thing, you know, if it could just not get to this point. And we went to the next appointment and they did the x-ray and her back was straight. And even the doctor could not explain it. Like, I think it honestly freaked him out. Um, Cause I asked him, I'm like, does this happen? Do people with scoliosis, does it just resolve itself? And he's like, no. Um, he's like, we, there must've been some mistake maybe with the previous like three x-rays they'd done over the course of like a year. Um, but he, he had no explanation for it. Um, and to this day, they, they followed her for another year. We had to go back and they kept doing the x-rays. Everything was still fine. And then they finally said, you know, she was okay and we didn't have to go back. But um, I have, I, I honestly don't think there's any other explanation for that outside of something, you know, otherworldly, um, you know, not, not human medicine. <laughs> And, and I assume, but I'm not sure that the fairies and these that you work with, that you're connected with, they're okay not to get credit? Yeah, um, generally, uh, there are certain things like those particular stories, um, it's, it's okay for me to tell. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain things that happen, you know, just in general with them throughout life that it's sort of a, you know, you don't talk about it. Um, mm -hmm whether it's like, you don't want to, they don't like people who brag and boast and are, you know, and try to make themselves seem special for things that the, the fairies are doing. So you kind of have to walk that line with things. Um, and I always try to be very clear with both of those circumstances that that was completely them, mm. their power, you know, with whatever they chose to do. Um, I certainly wasn't commanding anything or ordering anything. I was just kind of asking in a non-specific way, just, you know, help me please with wow. these situations. Amazing um, stories. Amazing. Yeah. And I do have the x-rays. I can, I can email them to you later if you want to see them. It's a wow. true story. Yeah. I love that. That should be in one of your books for sure. I think with the x-rays. So, okay. Let's go on to this fabulous book, chock full of info. So in this book, Pagan Portals, Fairy Queens, you write this in your dedication. My own journey in fairy was not something I ever expected to intersect with a fairy queen, and yet it did. My own spirituality was not something I ever thought would one day focus on a fairy queen, and yet it does. Mm -hmm. So can you explain your personal fairy intersections and what they've meant? Sure. So, and I, I think we might have talked about this on the first show a little bit. Um, I've always seen these beings. I've had these experiences, um, even when I was a small child, but it was always just sort of one aspect of, of things for me, of my spirituality. Um, you know, I, I obviously I talk a lot about fairies now and I, I primarily focus on that. Um, but there was other things going on, like like ghosts, human spirits. Um, you know, there, there was just a lot of things going on. And so for a long time with my spirituality, it was sort of diverse, like most people. Um, and then I had been invited by a friend to co-host a trip to Ireland in 2016. Um, and this was to focus on the Morrigan, who is a, a Irish pagan goddess. Um, we were doing a sacred sites tour, which was super awesome, by the way. I, I highly recommend going to Ireland if anyone ever has a chance to. Um, but the point of it was to focus on this one particular um, pagan goddess. And I found for myself when I got there that just everything immediately did not go to plan. <laughs> the, the tour itself was great. I think everyone who went on it had a good time and, and felt like they got what they needed to out of it. But for myself, um, I found that everything ended up focusing just completely on, on fairies, on the fair folk. And 
I ended up undergoing what I consider to be like an initiatory sort of experience with them. Um, and that really just, just altered everything for me. So since then, that has kind of become my primary focus with everything. I was always interested in it. I was always studying it. It was always an aspect of things. But after that, it sort of just became the, the entire picture, if that makes sense. Totally makes sense. I, I just have this curiosity when you say that. I don't know if you know Dolores Cannon's work with quantum healing hypnosis technique. I don't know, I'll have to look into it. Oh, girl. So brilliant. She's no longer with us, but she created mm -hmm. this hypnosis really just to help people. But of course, her mission came through. And she has put people under what they call QHHT. That's the acronym. Um, her work is world renowned. And she's got a lot of audibles, which I'm eating right now. I'm so voraciously going through them. And there's all these transcriptions of the hypnosis experiences. And in them, people are relaying all sorts of experiences. They do see fairies. They talk about um, amazing things, also UFOs and other past lives, like amazing. The reason why I say this is because I hear you and it just makes me wonder, because you're getting a lot of help. There is no doubt, right? That you're getting a lot of help. There's a lot of connection there. Do you think just instinctively or maybe knowingly that you have been fairy in another life or of course, really concurrent life? That's a really good question. Um, I have definitely had people, um, you know, outside intuitive people uh, tell me that they believe that to be true. Um, I, I do feel like I have some sort of connection that goes beyond anything that I can kind of easily explain. Um, you know, I think sometimes we, we're born into our current life with connections to things. And part of our journey in our life is to sort out some of those connections, what they are, what they mean. Um, and maybe this is what I was always meant to do while I was here. Uh, I love that. That's my download for you too. I appreciate it. Yeah. I have to really give that some thought too. So in your book, you write, I love this because this is really different. Like, and that's what's so cool about your work. You write about traveling in fairy with a disability. So great. So you offer these wonderful meditations and journey works. Can you talk about people who have a disability, a physical limitation in their human form, but what that means in the fairy world? Yeah, so I think that a lot of people, when they, they hear people talking about guided meditations or journey work or um, any sort of that focused uh, spiritual work that we can do, um, there tends to be sort of an assumption of kind of able-bodiedness, I guess you would say. Um, and I, I want people to realize that anyone can do this. You know, you don't have to um, be what, you know, society would consider able-bodied in order to be spiritual or to engage in spiritual things. And actually, historically, it was more common for people who had, you know, what we would call disabilities, things like being deaf or being blind or, you know, perceiving the world differently to be very spiritual and, and closer to certain things like fairies or angels or, you know, any of that. Um, and that's not something I see discussed in books a lot myself. So it was something that I wanted to mention. Um, and I did talk to a, a variety of my friends who, you know, deal with different particular issues, whether it's hard of hearing, deaf, um, very poor vision or blind. And, you know, found that some of them, when they do journey work or spiritual meditation work, um, in that work, they do not have the same physical uh, limitations or abilities. Um, so I have, you know, talked to people who are now deaf or hard of hearing, who used to be able to hear that find in journey experiences and guided meditations that they will get audio messages. Um, talk to people who um, 
you know, are, are blind now, but we're not always that find in um, guided meditation and journey experience that they, they can see. And I've also talked to people who find that, that when they do these things, they do still have those limitations, but those limitations don't affect hmm. how they can do that work. You know, like you can do a spiritual journey to a fairy queen, for example, or any other kind, um, even if you, um, you know, are deaf or are in a wheelchair or have any of these other issues. You just, when you do the work, um, have to sort of adapt it so that it works for you. So like if you're doing a guided meditation, they're talking about walking up a hill, you know, and you're in a wheelchair, you just have to, in your own mind, mm -hmm. put it into the context that works for you. Yeah. And I'd like to mention, because in one of your other books that I read, you make it very clear that when one crosses over and they're asked to do something, by a fairy, whether it's a kiss or will you do me this favor? Uh, there are many ways they can ask us for things. So talk about that a little bit, because I think that's important for people to hear that they go in with discernment. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm, I love that you phrased it that way, because I, I think discernment is exactly how we need to look at it. Um, it's when we're dealing with fairies in particular, we're really just dealing with Think of them like people, of course, that have a very different culture. Mm. So whereas, you know, in, in our culture, you know, in the United States, for example, we have certain assumptions when you meet someone, how it's appropriate to greet them, what it's appropriate to say. You know, we sort of understand what sarcasm is generally, things like that. And with fairies, it's completely different. So you have to understand things like, they will take you at your word. Um, sarcasm doesn't work well because <laughs> if you say something, but your intention is that you're saying it, meaning the opposite, sarcasm, they're going to take whatever you say. Um, so that took me a little while because I admit, like, I, I was very sarcastic as a teenager. Unsurprisingly, <laughs> most teenagers are sarcastic, I think, but I had to kind of unlearn that. And be like, okay, when I'm when I'm dealing with these beings, I can't do things like that because they're gonna take whatever I say as I say it. Um, you want to be careful about not promising things because that's another thing, like in, in our culture, at least you know, where I am in the United States, if someone says, Hey, do you want to go to the movies? You might say, Oh, yeah, definitely, you know, we'll go on such and such a day. And then if something comes up, it's not a big deal to be like, oh actually rain check, you know, whatever happened, I can't go. You cannot do that with fairies. If, if you agree that you're going to do something, you are making a commitment. Mm. Um, it's like a, a promise. Even if you don't specifically say like, I promise I'm going to do the thing. If you say it, that's kind of how they're going to take it. So you have to sort of just learn to watch how you're saying things. And I find it helpful if you just sort of try to remind yourself they're going to take everything literally. And it takes a little practice, you know, to sort of get into it and you'll make mistakes. I, I definitely made a lot of mistakes, especially when I was younger, but eventually you kind of get to understand um, sort of that culture, that different approach to things. And same thing um, if they say, I'd like a kiss or I'd like to marry you. Yep. Yeah, and this is where it gets really fun with them because they they do like semantics. So they can say, I want to kiss, and they might just mean, you know, they just want to kiss, but they can also sometimes mean other things that are, are kind of implied with that. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing with discernment that I'll tell people you have to. What do you kind mean? Of be you mean when apply, you mean they want to have sex if they say kiss or something? Well, poss possibly. Um, but more along the lines of like, sometimes there will be a deeper meaning. Um, like I had talked to a woman, this was at an event that I was uh, teaching at and we were just talking, um, after the class I'd done. And she was telling me about some of her experiences with fairies. And she mentioned that she was in a really bad place at one time, very heartbroken, um, long-term relationship had just ended 
And, you know, the fairies have kind of come to her and been like, well, we can help you with this. We can make it so that you're not sad about this anymore. Um, and she almost agreed, but then she kind of had a moment where she realized who she was talking to. You know, these aren't like angels, for example. Um, and so she said no, because she, she, she came to see that what they meant was they would just take away her ability to feel sadness. Oh. And then she just wouldn't feel sad. Oh. And to them, like they didn't mean any harm with it. It wasn't malicious, mm. but to them that fixes the problem. <laughs> you know, um, so sometimes with things like that, you just have to be a little cautious um, in how, how they're saying things, I guess is a better way to say it. Mm. Um, because they, they literally meant we will make it so you are not sad anymore. Like, at all ever and she didn't want to live that way because you know sadness is is healthy at times um so things like that you just have to be cautious and like if you're you're meeting a fairy in a, a meditation or a journey and you know you ask them like will you help me and they say well i won't do you any harm they're not actually saying they're going to help you and they're not saying they're going to protect you from other things. They're just saying they personally won't hurt you. Mm. So you just have to be careful because a human saying that would be a little bit different. There'd be more of an implication of like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be your friend or whatever. Um, but they, they really mean what they say. Very little. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh my gosh. It's so fascinating. Those are great examples. So the queen of Elfland, you say in Scotland, she's called the queen of the Seelie court. Yes. And she's an especially good fairy queen for all of us to begin with. So what should we know about the queen of Elfland? Sure. So um, I should say to start that like in, in Scottish folklore, the words fairy and elf are kind of interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So she's the queen of fairies, but Elfland is just another word for like the world of fairy the other world. Um, I just don't want to confuse anyone who's listening, who's trying to figure out why we're talking about fairies and elves. Um, if they think they're different things, like, no, it's, they're, they're the same in this context. Um, and there's two courts of fairies in, in Scottish folk belief. And one of them is the Seelie court, which is the one we're talking about. And they are sort of the ones that are more inclined to be helpful to humans. Um, they're the ones who are known to like travel around and just be randomly generous and sort of uh, random acts of kindness, if you will, towards humans they run across. And um, in contrast to them, we have the unseely court and they're the ones kind of like that water fairy, water spirit that I ran into that just generally don't see a lot of use for humans. <laughs> Um, they're not, they're not in the human fan club. We'll put it that way. Um, so those tend to be the ones in folklore that are more malicious and, and dangerous, and you don't really want to run into them if you can avoid it. So the Seelie court, the Seelie queen, the queen of Elfland, she is sort of the one who is known to be really open to, um, interacting with humans, first of all, and also doing so in a positive way. Like we have a lot of stories of her helping people um, and particularly of doing things without necessarily always asking for something in return. Because the other thing about fairies, I like to joke that we need like fairy lawyers to help us with them. Is <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're a very like tit for tat mm. kind of group. So they're often like, if, if they do something for you, they expect something in return. Um, if you give them something and they accept it and they like it, they will give you something in return. It's about keeping that balance. You know, they don't, they don't want to be in your debt and it's generally not a good idea for you to be in their debt either. Um, but it's, there's a bit of an exception with the queen because she can do things just because she's decided to be nice to you and you don't have to worry about, you know, it's not like the mafia. You're not going to like owe them a favor. <laughs> like in the movie um 
so the queen of Elfland, we see her in a couple different stories. We see her in, in ballads. Um, Thomas the Rhymer is one. Um, there's another one called the Ballad of Alison Gross, actually, where uh, there's this man who's been cursed into the shape of a worm, which is kind of random, but that's how the story goes. And he has to just keep circling this tree. That's his curse because um, he offended a witch and a uh, fairy tale, which I should clarify. Um, and the, the queen of the Seelie court rides by one night and sees him and just spontaneously uncurses him just as a, as a kind gesture <laughs> and frees him from this. Um, so that's sort of the stories that we have about her. And for people who are interested in contacting these beings and engaging with them, that's kind of what makes her the perfect one to start with because we know that she's a little more forgiving and a little more generous and more inclined to be interested in humans and, and being helpful to humans as opposed to some of the others. Okay. And what about their court system, the fairy queen court system? How, talk a little bit about that and how that operates. Sure. So like I said, in Scotland, we have these sort of two courts um, some people will call them the good fairies and the bad fairies, but I try to avoid that because it's, it's sort of a moral judgment and, you know, it's, it's better to think of it more like the ones who like humans and the ones who don't like humans as much. Okay. Um, and they're not either one of them like good or evil or, or what have you, but it's, it's sort of set up the same way you would think of like a, a human Royal court would be. So you have the queen, um, at least with the Seelie court, there's a king as well. Um, and then you have knights and sort of all of what we would imagine with like medieval royalty um, sort of going on. And then it trickles down to just the everyday, everyday fairies, if we can call any fairies, everyday fairies. Um, but that's specific to Scotland. So when we look at like Ireland, as opposed to these two opposing groups, what we find is just that there's a lot of regional queens um, and kings as well. So there isn't that sort of some really like humans, some don't like humans as much. It's more just whatever area you happen to be in is going to have uh, a queen um, or a king who kind of is in charge of that area. Um, not like these huge expansive kingdoms like we might imagine, but just smaller. Um, like we might think of counties within a state mm. kind of area over here. Um, and some of them are more inclined to, to like humans. Some of them are a little less. Uh, most of them though are, especially the kings and queens seem to find humans kind of interesting and entertaining. Um, are there important ways to include for those listening the fairy queens in our life through our physical space? I have personally found, um, for me, what works really well is artwork. Oh. There's a lot of amazing artwork out there. Um, and uh, some of it specific to fairy queens. Uh, obviously, it's art. So, you know, there's, there's something out there for anyone's taste, no matter what you happen to like. Um, but I find that maybe it's because I'm a more visual person. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at something, and it's a depiction of a fairy queen or it's, you know, something in, in, in the, that theme. It, even if I'm just glancing at it for a second, it, it gets that thought in my head. So I'm, I'm always kind of reminded and thinking of it. Um, so it's a good way to sort of have that, um, have that constant reminder. And the fairies in general and the fairy queens in particular tend to be, I guess what we would call like maybe hedonistic, like, mm -hmm. They're very into things that would involve the senses. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's it's not a it's not a painful thing to try to, to try to surround yourself with stuff that's going to connect them, like mm. you know, scented candles, um, anything that kind of you personally would come to associate with them. Um, but they they do tend to like things that we might consider um, luxurious, uh, which I mean, they're royalty, so. I guess that would make sense. Um, so I've also found that it, it works pretty well to um, have things around me that sort of 
get me in that frame of mind. Is there a way to protect ourselves so that we only call in benevolent beings? There is. And this, this I think is one area where fairies being so literal with words can kind of help humans out. Um, so if you wanted to, for example, invite things in, mm-hmm. you would never want to say, you know, I invite in any fairy being that wants to come visit me because that's trouble asking for trouble but if you say i invite in um, any kindly inclined any goodly inclined spirits that want to be my friends because of the way fairies are just by their nature and the way they're sort of bound um by that literalness by by the semantics and by the words in ways that humans aren't um you're not going to get anything responding to that that isn't agreeing to those terms if you see what I'm saying I love that yeah I actually I actually love working with fairies because I find them so much more straightforward whereas some other types of spirits can be real tricky in a different sort of way um you know that that other spirits lie fairies don't lie um they can trick you if you're not paying attention to how things are being said um but I find them, once you get your head around that idea, they're, they're much easier to deal with, in my opinion. And what if we have an oopsie? It's like really just out of I- innocent ignorance, we offend them. Uh, is there a way for restoration? Is there a way to fix the relationship going forward? Yes. Um, and I, again, I love that you said restoration because that's exactly what you'd be looking at. And this gets into that that balance sheet that I was talking about with them, that they, they like for things to be even. Mm. So if you say something that kind of offends them, it basically puts you in a position where you would owe them something. <laughs> so if you turn around then and give them something, and they, they generally love dairy products, um, bread, uh, cakes, but we would consider like um, sweet cakes. So like I find pumpkin bread, for example, mm. zucchini bread, stuff like that um, works really well. Um, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, honey, any of that kind of stuff. Um, poetry, song, they, they all love music. So any kind of music is a good option. And just be clear that, you know, I'm giving this or I'm singing this song or I'm doing this for you as an apology to acknowledge that I, you know, messed up or did something I shouldn't have done. Um, and they're, yeah, they're very much about that restorative justice and that, that'll that usually do a lot to fix things. Would that we could use that everywhere in this human world if something goes awry that you can say to somebody, I'm gonna sing you this song as an apology, please accept it. I mean, that's really beautiful. It is, I actually, I do wish that in the human world we could do that and be like, you know, I, I am really sorry. Let me sing you. Well, maybe not me because my singing voice is terrible, but, you know, let me recite you this poem mm. and that that would show your remorse in a way that people would be like, all right, I understand. I accept your apology. Yeah. How special that they can receive like that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about a few of the gods and goddesses of pagan Ireland. Pick out a, maybe one or two and share some history, some mythology, some symbols, especially if these gods or goddesses are active in the world today and the gods or goddesses who are powerful forces who can bless us or challenge us. Yes, definitely. Um, Well, I'll start with a couple that are also connected to the world of fairy, since that's kind of our wider topic too. Um, so one particular god who he used to be a little more obscure, but he is definitely gaining a lot of popularity. So I would say very active in the world today. Um, his name is the Dagda. Um, and it just in Irish, it just means the good God. Um, and good in the sense of like he's he's good at everything, does everything well. And he is sort of connected to um, particularly ideas of like abundance and prosperity and protection. And um, you can kind of see why people like him so much. He's supposed to have a cauldron that is always full of delicious food that nobody goes hungry from, um, you know, so 
it's he's 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 a good god <laughs> it's his name suits him um he's also said to be the king of all of the fairies of ireland so while we have like these individual regional kings and queens like i talked about earlier he is supposed to be like the king who's in charge of everybody um kind of over everybody else according to the mythology um he is the one the stories say when humans first came to ireland um and the the gods were sort of um went into the the fairy hills and, and joined with the fairies initially the crops wouldn't grow and the cows wouldn't give milk and it was kind of a disaster until the humans went to the dagda to this particular god and they sort of made um friends and made this deal that the humans would give a portion of the crops a portion of the crops and a portion of the milk um, in order to have abundance and uh, then everything was happy and everything was good uh, and that that's actually continued till today people still believe that um, although now it's the fairies that get a portion of things so um, yeah he's he's a popular one everyone should look him up because he's super fun too he's got some how really do you spell stories. his name d-a-g-d-a Dagda. Dagda. Yep. Um, and the artwork for him is usually fun too, because he's kind of described as being this sort of big, um, kind of beefy, sometimes people picture him a little pot belly guy with like a big red beard and red hair. So he looks sort of friendly and, you know, like he would be a, a fun guy to hang out with. <laughs> Um, and you know, that's sort of how he is in his stories too. So how do you know all of this, Morgan? Is this like, you're just incredibly well-educated and read, or have you traveled to their lands so often that they've schooled you, they've taught you? How do you come by this incredible wealth of, I could throw any question at you <laughs> and you're always right there. And the, the information is fascinating. So you're like an Akashic record library of all things fairy and elemental. So what? Thank you. Where did all this come from? Um, it's a little bit of everything you just mentioned. Um, I I do really read a lot and study a lot. Um, I learned Old and Middle Irish, which is the language that the the myths were originally written in, um, so that I could read them in the originals because some of the translations get a little wacky. Victorian translators were really fond of just editing stuff out if they felt it was not appropriate for their Victorian audience. So I've, you know, I've read a lot of that material. Um, I am really lucky to have some very good friends in Ireland that are also super knowledgeable about this stuff um, and have helped me a lot and taught me a lot about uh, quite a few of these things. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, John O'Sullivan, Laura O'Brien, Anthony Murphy, all these people who are just really amazingly knowledgeable about these stories and these beings um, and their connection to different places in the landscape. Um, so that, that definitely plays a role. Um, and I have been lucky enough to go to Ireland um, several times. I'm actually going back again in October and to sort of connect to it myself um, you know, in, in a more direct way. And I think all of that, you know, kind of layers on itself. And help me out because when I read your bio at the beginning, I'm, I'm not sure how much I bastardized that word because I really That's would okay. like to get it right. Priestess of the Deoin Matha. Is that correct? Dini Maha. It's Oof. Irish. And I know Irish is, it's very different for English speakers to look at because it has different grammar and pronunciation rules, but it's, yeah, Thini, which means people, um, and then Maha, which means good. So good people, it's, it's a name for the fairies. And how did you get the, how were you ordained a priestess of the good people? So that's a fun story. So <laughs> I had mentioned in 2016, when I went to Ireland that I, I ended up going through this sort of initiatory experience and that, had a couple layers to it. Um, it started when I was at um, Rothcrohan, which is in Tulsk in Roscommon. And I ended up having uh, what I would guess I'd describe as like a visionary experience. I was in um, 
the Cave of Cats, Onagat, which is a place very strongly associated with the Morrigan, um, who's that um, Irish goddess. And um, when I was in there, I'd had this experience where I sort of saw this um, fairy hall opening up and heard this music and it's hard to put it into words without making it sound like really trite but in the moment it was just a very profound experience for me and the next night I was actually at a place that's called Tlaxca in um, Athboy in Ireland where they do this huge Halloween festival and it's this big ceremony uh, with a bonfire and the year that I was there I think it was like 2,000 people were there um, gathered on this hill and there's storytelling and there's there's a ritual and it's um, it's just an amazing amazing thing um, and the the year that I was there I had a small part in the ritual where I was asked to sort of um, invite in the fairies invite in the good folk and the woman who was um, running things uh, who is herself like just an amazing amazing person um, Gemma McGowan, she uh, is a priestess. Uh, and when she was introducing me, um, she was the one who actually gave me the title of priestess of the fairies, priestess of the Aishi. Um, and that was sort of the, the moment where everything kind of gelled for me. Um, there's a lot of other things that were going on too. I don't want to like spend the entire tea of our time talking about just this but um so she was the one who who kind of spoke it into being and they recognize you in the other world as a priestess of the good people yeah yeah it's it's sort of my my purpose here there's a different word for it in irish but it the closest best translation um for my use in english would be priestess um you know it's it's sort of my my purpose here at this point is to, to do what I'm doing here, to help to um, explain this to people and to talk to people about who fairies are, what fairies are, um, to sort of bring people back to this older understanding of fairies that's not the sort of small, you know, Disney winged sprite understanding of them, which is a thing, of course, that is out there. But for people to see them um, sort of the way I described the ones I saw in Iceland, like human sized, um, more human in appearance, able to interact with humans, um, able to be helpful, able to, you know, potentially be dangerous, um, which is the older and also the more like um, traditional cultural, I guess you would say understanding of them. Um, you know, they're, they're powerful and they can be very positive if you engage with them in a respectful way. Do fairies have a divine purpose? That is an excellent question. Um, for myself, I would say that they do. Um, I think that like everything else in existence, everything that exists has a purpose, in my opinion. I'm sure someone will disagree with me, <laughs> but in my opinion, um, I think that they in many ways are sort of a pure embodiment of magic. Um, and I've, I've, I've had the opinion for a while that humans and fairies exist in a sort of symbiotic relationship. I think that they need us. Um, I think that they need us particularly for like innovation and to help them move forward. They tend to sort of copy human culture, but I think that we need them for that spark, that, that magic, that energy, that um, creativity. Um, I think that they have that, but we are better at focusing that. But we can't focus it if we don't sort of get that from them, if that makes sense. So we each need each other. And what fairies and elementals, what is their connection to children? You know, a lot of people have wondered about this for a long time, and I, I don't know that there's any obvious clear answer. My personal theory is that children exist in a sort of pure state of belief. 
Um, you know, as we get older and older, society, the people around us sort of take that away from us um, and teach us that we have to be rational and that if we have a strange experience, we have to explain it away, even if there's no real explanation for it. Like the doctor with my, my child's x-rays, there is no explanation for that but it's easier for him to decide that it is some sort of repetitive x-ray mistake um, or something like that than to believe that it's something you might call miraculous, you know, in this case fairies, but um, children don't have that filter. You know, children, if they look out and they see a fairy, then they're gonna say, I see a fairy. They're not gonna be like, oh, my eyes must be tired you know, maybe I've had too much coffee today. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm seeing things. Um, children just accept the experience for what it is. And I think that that then tends to attract those beings uh, because there's an awareness that this is someone who is not going to try to explain it away. It's not going to ignore it. Um, or, you know, try yeah. to children have such an innocence. I mean, they believe yes. in all of this. It hasn't, you know, yet been indoctrinated into them to disbelieve in what they're actually seeing. Yes. But I can imagine they ha have an ability to even interact. That maybe yeah, it's, they don't. it's really common actually for children to have encounters and to talk about encounters far more than adults. Um, there was a, a fairy census that was done online where people would write in and, and describe fairy experiences they'd had. And um, someone had kind of gone through and looked at all the material and realized that, um, you know, 30 to 40% of the accounts were from people who had had the experience as children. Mm. And, you know, I think to me at least that, that says that because children are more open to these things, they're more aware of them, they remember them, you know, they don't dismiss them. Um, it's that, like you said, it's that innocence, that purity of spirit, um, and the fact that they just accept it. They don't, they don't try to find another explanation when they see something that, you know, rational, in quotation marks, rational adults would say, oh, that's not possible. Mm. You know, you, you can't see a giant moth that has the body of a man. You can't see, mm. <laughs> you know, um, a, a woman in a river that clearly is not human doing whatever she's doing. Um, you know, adults find explanations to justify why that didn't happen. Children are just like, no, that's what happened. That's what I saw, <laughs> you know, and I, I think that's a beautiful thing, honestly. Oh, I like this explanation you gave because it makes me wonder when you give these descriptions, the moth, and as the story where you saw the fairy, the woman fairy, what is the nature? What is the physicality of the fairy people? So this is the interesting thing about fairies. And this is another thing that kind of differentiates them a bit from some other types of spirits. They exist in this sort of middle nature. And I'm quoting Reverend Robert Kirk here because he, he wrote about fairies in the 17th century, but he had some brilliant things to say. Um, they have the ability to be physical. They can physically interact with people. They can be physically present, but they also have the ability to be incorporeal. And they seem to be able to control sort of how present they are in our reality, in our world. Um, and we have a, a lot of stories about this, actually. Um, there's one from Germany of a uh, fairy woman, an elf woman who um, came through a wall, passed through the cracks in a wall, and then became, you know, physically solid and became the wife of the man who was living there, had four children with him, and then one day just turned around and disappeared the way she'd come, um, you know, became insubstantial and, and left. <laughs> I don't know, maybe she decided after a while she didn't want to stay married to him. I don't know. It's a fairy equivalent of divorce, but um, you know, we have these stories like that that sort of talk about how they can they can do things that humans can definitely not do, <laughs> walk through walls, um, you know, pass through keyholes, all of these things, but they can also be like tangibly real. Uh, so it's it's really fascinating to me. 
And is there something you do, Morgan, on a daily basis that is a ritual or a practice for you with the fairies, whether that's engagement or not? But how do you show up and what do you do? I mean, for me personally, one thing that I like to do is take at least like five minutes every day and just uh, try to find a quiet space. As I've mentioned, I do have children, so sometimes that works more than others, but try to find a quiet moment um, and just take five minutes and sort of um, go into like a meditative breathing um, where I'm, I'm counting my breaths and just really let my mind rest on them. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, like let myself think about them as they are um, without sort of trying to process any of it. Um, I guess it's sort of the same way anyone doing sort of meditative practices, you might contemplate like um, a flower or a tree or a flame or, you know, to just sort of sit with that. Um, but I find for myself that helps me continue to feel sort of connected to this, to the energy of it. Um, and to remind me that it's there along with the artwork. Mm. So I know people can go to Amazon if they spell your name right, D-A-M-I-L-I-E-R. Morgan is the first name. They can also go to johnhuntpublishing.com for your many, many amazing books. But you also mentioned um, that you had been teaching and I know you speak everywhere and I've seen you show up in other things that I'm on newsletters for. So somebody who's interested would like to hear you speak, follow you a little more, uh, where can they go? What's possible? Sure, um, I do have a, a Facebook page, um, Facebook author page, I have a Twitter, um, social media, it's, it's inescapable, but it's useful. Um, so I'll post there uh, when I'm gonna be doing things like this or when I'm teaching. Um, I do teach uh, classes to the Irish Pagan School, which is an online school. Um, obviously, my main classes are about fairies, um, different topics related to that. Um, but that would be a good, good way for people who are looking for my teaching um, to go to. And then uh, when I do random classes uh, or random things, like I mentioned in October, I'm going to be in Ireland. I'm going to a um, sci-fi and fantasy convention called Octacon um, to talk about my novel, which you were holding up earlier, which is coming out next year. Um, so stuff like that, I would talk about on my social media so that people were aware sort of, of, of what I was doing. Okay. Excellent. I'm pretty sure we are connected on Facebook. I'm going to make sure note yes. to self because yeah, we should important. be. Yeah, we should be. Absolutely. This novel Morgan's talking about that's coming out, man, I can't wait. I have to read a lot of self-help for the guests who come in my show, but to like deep dive. And I mean, oh my God, I could already feel the vibe of this. Yummy. I love the picture. Done. So there's that. And then if you really resonate again, you can look up her books and there's something for everybody. The one we talked about today, Fairy Queens, Pagan Portals. This is uh, this particular book. And of course, if you love what you shared, she shared, you can understand she's a prolific writer. Morgan, I loved having you back on again so much. Thank you for sumptuous conversation. Thank you so much for having me back. It was really great. Amazing. I end today's show with this quote. Believe in the fairies who make dreams come true. Believe in the wonder, the stars and the moon. Believe in the magic from fairies above. They dance in the flowers and sing songs of love. And if you just believe, oh, the dog's like this. <laughs> and if you just believe and always stay true, the fairies will be there to watch over you. Mm. Next week, please tune in again to this number one transformation conversation. Subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast. Sorry, but my dogs, all three of them, clearly know something's going on because there's nobody here. <laughs> so subscribe to this and please leave us comments. We love reading about it. My guest next week is, interestingly enough, Irish. Siobhan Nicolau, who's an expert in the field of alchemical transmutation and offers global soul readings. You will want to be here for that. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. As you can hear, 
There's help everywhere. There's relationships everywhere with the otherworldlies. Just use discernment and do it properly. And you could have an adventure of a lifetime. I adore you all. And thanks for joining us.